this year, we've talked a lot about vocations. Bridget talked about marriage. Alex talked about the re religious life. And Father Eric came and talked about music. Today, I'm going to talk to you about vocation in your everyday life. It's really easy to think of vocation as something that's far off in the future, and it's way too complicated to figure out right now. After all, vocation isn't even a word you can really use on a daily basis. As high schoolers, you probably get asked a lot of questions about your future. What kind of job do you want to work? Where do you want to go to college? What will you say? Do you want to get older? You still have to spend a whole lot of time thinking about the future. How am I going to buy a house? Provide for my family? Or get that job I want? We all tend to worry a lot about how we will do things. On the other hand, your future self can be a great person to load off responsibility onto. You know, I can just slack off at school and work hard later. I'll get a great job, earn a ton of money, ton of money and have a great time. My future self will work on a waiting set. I just don't have the motivation right now. Don't tell yourself that. The path to your future is paved with the choices you make right now. The most important part of your vocation is what God is calling you to do today. Well, okay, great. That sounds all great and idealistic, but how in the world do I know what God wants me to do today? Well, I'm going to give you a few examples of saints and people who really put that call of God first in their lives. The first is San Jose Sanchez de Lillo. Jose was 13 years old when the Cristero Wars broke out in Mexico in 1926. The new communist president, Plutarco Calles, outlawed Catholicism and had many priests and clergy killed or exiled. Soldiers loyal to the president would destroy churches and execute anyone found practicing Catholicism or even present possessing religious items like a Bible, a crucifix, or a rosary. A rebel army was formed called the Cristeros, since they fought for Christ. Jose's two older brothers joined the rebels, and Jose begged his parents to let him go, but they refused because he was too young. That didn't stop him, though. He kept asking and asking until finally they relented. Then he had to convince the rebel general to let him fight. At first, the general refused because Jose was so young, but eventually, decided to compromise and let Jose be the flag bearer. During a heated battle, another soldier lost his horse and Jose gave him his own so he could escape. Jose was captured by the government soldiers in prison. They tried to force him to renounce his faith, torturing him and even making him, making him watch the execution of the Bill Cristero. What did Jose do though? He prayed the rosary daily for those soldiers while still refusing to renounce his faith. After two weeks of torture and prison, he was sentenced to be executed. The soldiers sliced the soles of his feet and, um, uh, <laughs> with machetes and forced him to walk barefoot to his awaiting grave. Standing, uh, yes, thank you for that foreshadowing. <laughs> That's great. Um, they, so, yeah, they forced him to walk barefoot to his awaiting grave. Standing over it, they gave him one last chance to live by just saying, Death to Jesus Christ. How did he respond? Viva Cristo Rey, long live Christ the King. His last act after being shot was to draw a cross of the sword. That was extreme, right? It gets better. In Austria, during the Nazi occupation, there was a man named Franz Jägerstar. He was a bit of a hothead, and he was jailed for gang violence as a young, as a young man. He left town for a few years worked as a minor, but eventually came back, married, had a family, and worked on a farm. For some reason, he became very devout after returning home. He and his wife made a pilgrimage to the Vatican just after getting married, but otherwise, he was just a small town father and farmer. Then, in 1938, the Nazis arrived. Now, his commitment to his beliefs really set him apart. He was offered the position of town mayor, but refused. He was also the only person in his village to vote against the annexation of Austria by the Nazis. He was conscripted into the Nazi army, but not yet asked to fight. At a nearby army garrison, he went through basic military training, but refused to take the oath of allegiance to Hitler. Usually, this would mean death. However, he was allowed to go home because of an exception for farmers. When he learned about the Nazi euthanasia programs, he had to make the decision. When he was finally called to active duty in 1943, he reported to the garrison and declared his objection to fighting. Immediately, his superiors threw him into prison pending execution. His 
village priest came and visited him in prison and employed him to change his mind or just do whatever his commanders asked of him. However, he held fast to this decision and was executed a few days later. This man knew that his children would become fatherless and his wife a widow, yet he still chose to stick to his beliefs. Even though he could have just gone along with his orders or tried to run away, he stood up to the yield of his office. Now that's just about as extreme height. We are not at war right now, so why worry about having to deal with something like that? Well, here's another much different example of putting Christ first in your life. Carlo Abdutis was a young boy in the early 2000s in Milan. He went to school just like any other kid. He was a computer geek and loved to play video games and hang out with his friends. He also loved to go to mass and spend time training before the tabernacle. He received his first communion early and went to confession. Since he was a computer whiz, he decided to start a catalog of Eucharistic miracles, which he completed in 2005. That same year, he developed leukemia, and his condition rapidly worsened until he died in 2006 at the age of 15. During that time, did he lose hope though? No. He dedicated his suffering to the Lord for the Pope and for the Church. Now, I've certainly never had the urge to catalog Eucharistic miracles or anything like that. How can any of us even come close to them? Well, notice that these guys were all just living their lives until somebody else came along and started a war where they contracted a terminal illness. Before those tremendous life events revealed the strength of their faith, not many people really knew about them. They each just made a habit of committing completely to their beliefs moment by moment, even when life threw them a curveball. Otherwise, they lived fairly normal lives as teenagers or fathers. Vocation is part of the process of conversion. God never stops calling you to be more holy. He believes in you. Your specific vocation may change as you go through life. For example, all of you are in high school right now, so you're called to focus on school. Maybe you also play a sport, or play music, or draw art, or ride an ambulance. However, you would not always be a teenager or be in school. You're going to progress to new opportunities and challenges. In those, you have to choose to commit yourself to Christ. Faith is not a taxi ride. You are in the driver's seat, and if you don't step on the gas, you're not going to get anywhere. Now, that doesn't mean you have to speed down the highway. Start small. Take five minutes out of your day to pray. If that's too much, start with one minute. What else? Make sure you get to church on Sunday and go to confession. When you see somebody who needs your help, take that phone call from the guy. Don't let it go to work All right, Matt. But none of that is the same as becoming a soldier or dying for your dreams. While it certainly involves less pain, you still please God just as much if, if you take the skills you have and put them to work. We are created to create. Remember that parable when the poor lady comes into the temple after the rich man and just puts in a few pennies? What matters is that you give what you have to God. God gave you your skills and talents for you to use them. When you take the initiative to hone them and produce good with them, you give those gifts back to Him. To close, I have three challenges for you. Pursue excellence. Pursue holiness. Pursue God. Yeah.